Hi, Chris. Hi. I like you. I like you. Okay. That was instant nervousness, by the way, when you slipped on, when you when you flipped the switch from just two dudes talking to Miles, the podcast. Host, I wish you could. My whole body got scared. I wish you could feel like what it feels like in my body <laughs> when I have to go, okay, it's time it's to start time, the yeah. podcast voice. Yeah. You have to turn on the podcast voice now. Okay, so now that we have the podcast voice. I'm going to use my same voice. Uh, I'll probably eventually get to mine, but I'm going to overthink it for a while. Um, in the meantime, I, I don't know how you ended up doing sessions. Yeah. I don't know this. Will you tell me this, please? I just had a very normal childhood and I got interested in music kind of in a weird vacuum, right? Like I didn't have industry family or like know a bunch of industry people. I knew I had a few kind of early mentors and it wasn't really kind of until I got to college that I started to meet all of the people that I know. Did you go to college yeah, here? I did. Yeah, I went to Trevecca. Oh. So I grew up in the Nazarene church. That makes more sense. Okay. And that was the place. That's how that works. That's the yeah. place that you went, right? It yeah. was just, you just fed right into that thing and they kind of had that's a music. That's the pipeline. They had a music program, which turns out wasn't much of a music program. But then I started just kind of like doing gigs. and. So you wouldn't necessarily attribute all of your success to Trevecca Nazarene University? I, no, I wouldn't. Strangely enough. Okay. All right. That's fair. I would attribute my marriage. I met I met sweet Heather Donegan in school, and that's oh, the nice. best thing I got. Thank you, out Trevecca. Of that. Thank you, Trevecca. Yeah, that's okay. right. So you never left. You've been no, here the whole no, time. No, no, I never left. Yeah, I, I've never Did lived. Did you tour? Yeah. Yeah, but, well, so growing up here, right, knowing that the session scene existed, like I can remember asking the few kind of music industry adjacent people I knew, like, what do I have to do to be a session player when I was about 13. Oh, so it was I, on your radar. I knew that it existed, and I was like, that sounds like the coolest fucking job on the planet to just go make records all day long. What I, what I thought it was and what it ended up being are two very different things, primarily because I was interested in it 20 years before I really was doing it all day, right. every day, right? And so it just changed out from underneath me. But yeah, I was here, and so I toured, but always with – the intention of never being gone for too long. Oh, a lot okay. of indie tours, a lot of Americana tours. Like I, I did a lot of that. I did one proper country tour for like three years. What was that? Sarah Evans. And this was right as I was having my second child. It's right as, as we were having Iris. So like I was kind of touring in, in, in the little indie indie scene that I was working in doing some sessions, indie records, custom records, demos here and there. My wife was working at a place called Echo Music, which was like a marketing kind of whatever for Mark Montgomery was his place. They sold to Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster laid everybody off. And so overnight, I was like, I got to figure out a way to like double my income because we have young kids and whatever auditioned for and got the little big town gig. But we had a due date with a child in between a six weeks run. And I was like, Hey, I can, I can take the gig, but I, I, I might have to come home in the middle of this. And they were like, we don't let anybody sub. So I said, no, flew to New Jersey the day after that daughter was born, played a gig with Derek and with like Jonathan Lawson and a couple other people. And then just, Derek was like, man, I'm leaving this thing. Do you need to go, you know, do you want to jump in in this spot? And so just very like organically landed in that place. I did that until it started to conflict with sessions. And then I left that. Well, what did that look like? When I took that gig, we were on Rascal Flats tour as like direct support. Leave Friday, back Sunday. 60, 70 shows a year, like pretty chill, pretty easy. And it didn't conflict with my session work week. Which you were starting to have more which of I was, Which point. I was starting to have more of, right? And so it was like, oh, this is cool. I can do, I can do both. Sarah's gig became more like, hey, we got a Tuesday thing right. in Albuquerque and we're going to stay out till Friday, right? Like it, it was like, we're doing, doing a casino here and a casino here. We don't really want to go home. 
And so I was starting to have to choose between do I stay on this or do I jump off and try to do this other thing. Knowing that, I started stacking money away. I subbed a couple of gigs and then they were like, we don't want you to sub anymore. And I said, okay, well, this, this, this is my last day, yeah. right? Like this date in the future that I can't make, we'll just, that'll be it. And then I just supplemented the session scene with the money that I had stacked away. And here we are. So in that first transition of coming off the road and going into sessions, you didn't, you weren't having to like work another job or. No, no, I didn't. <clears throat> there was still a lot of indie, indie records, a lot of demos, a lot of, a lot of piecing it together and not a lot of like, there, there was not really like a master's scene in my life yet when I came off the road. Right. Right. And so I just had a pile of cash and I would just try to use it as slowly as I possibly could. And we had three kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was like, I'm just going for broke here. I always, I always find it interesting where that moment happens for yeah. guys and, and how it happens because, you yeah. know, there's, there's a couple ways to go about it. I get a lot of questions of how do I make that transition? Yeah. How do I get off the road or how do I start doing studio stuff? And it's like, yeah. you're going to have to sacrifice something, whether it's saving money, if you get that opportunity, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes you don't get that opportunity to have money to save away or yeah. whatever. You know, Tom Douglas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He grossly overpaid me for a demo one time because we were talking about, I had come off the road and I, like we were buying a bigger house cause we, we'd outgrown the little place, our little first place we bought. And I was just down to the wire. And I literally like, we maybe had less than a hundred dollars to our name. Right, and right. he, when I got to check for that, you know, work tape demo, whatever I did, it was just like way more than it should have been. And that moment was the difference. I had the exact same thing where it was, I got asked to join a band. And so they paid me $3,500 to fly out to LA to do a video shoot and all this shit. Mm -hmm. And the original drummer decided to come back in. So I got flown back, but now I have a month off and I have $3,500 that I didn't have before. Yeah. And so I just played for free and did whatever I could and blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know. So much of this, I was thinking about how much of what we do is just reactive. It's different, but at the same time, none of us did it on accident. Yeah. And that's important to note because yeah. they're asking, how do you do it? And it's yeah. kind of like, you just fucking you, do it. You just do. And, and there'll be a moment that, there will either be a moment that feels right, or there will be a moment that feels like, man, maybe I can make this work. Or there'll be a moment where you go, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to try it anyway. And if it doesn't work, then I will go get another job. Right? right. Like I just, but there was a moment where if I don't stop touring so that I can say yes to the sessions, I'm going to have to continue to say no to the sessions. If you say no to somebody a couple of times and that may not come back around for a while. Whether we all believe this or not, there is a very high possibility that there is a stigma attached to being a touring musician sure. in the first place yeah. and primarily simply because availability right people right. want a yes they mm -hmm. don't want to have to call for people so they're going to call the person that they think is best suited and most available sure yeah so yeah it is you know there's there's a lot of guys that are still doing the road stuff and trying to do full-time session it's like yeah. Uh, at a yeah. certain point, you kind of, I mean, yes, we have guys that are doing touring now, yeah. Yeah. but it's because they have established session careers. Mm -hmm. That's why guys like Danny and Nick and, you know, they can go yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also the toughest, like the, the amount of it that exists in comparison to the number of people that want to do it makes it a tough, yeah. a tough nut to crack. And Whereas touring, it, it's... There's a lot of opportunities, right? And there's... A, Yes. And when you have a creative job, rejection is a thing. It it, it, yeah. it wears on you. <laughs> and so you want to put yourself in a position where you feel like you can succeed. Yeah. Your competition in the largest of quotations, very small group of your dear friends. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whereas with touring, you know, there's there's a thousand drummers, there's a thousand guitar players, there's right. tons of artists. And the stakes are a lot higher to if you land in a room for the first time, one or two instances of somebody going, I don't, I don't know, might be it for that camp. I've certainly had those kind of things early on where I think I was too left field sometimes. Mm -hmm. I just kept showing up 
in certain places. And then the last straw is having a couple people who are kind of tastemakers start to hire you on a regular basis. And that changes the whole perception of the whole thing. But that story is 20 years in the making. It takes time, right? Like you can't be in a hurry about it. I want this. Mm -hmm. I, I need this. I'm ready for it. But now what? It's not just how do I get there. It's how do you get there at the right time, at the right speed, right. at the right, right, you know, how do you get there when you should? I feel like a large part of where I am right now is being around at a time that a kind of a vacuum started to open up. Also myself learning like, okay, you can be left field guy, but you still have to do it within the confines of whatever. Like there's some days where you walk in and you're just creating and there are no seemingly no boundaries. There are always boundaries. Right. right. And then there are some days where it's like, you're, you're creating within a pretty specific confine. You can be yourself. I can be myself, but the course still needs power cords. And the third course is probably still broken down. And they still probably really do like that thing on the work tape. And so you should probably be getting that right. And so it's not like, like my disposition for a long time is like, I'm going to play something that I've never played before on every track I've ever, I ever play. For me, that was certainly a learned skill, right? Like, like when to, when to impose a lot of personality on something and when to recognize that just the way that I played the instrument doing someone else's part, doing the part that was already on the demo, that's enough personality, right? Like just, the, just the, how I touch the instrument right. is all of the personality that that part needs. You are perceived in some circles as being left field guy. Yeah. So you may play the exact part from the demo, possibly even more rigid right. and, and yeah. more mechanical yeah. and more clinical than what was on there, but it's heard as being super yeah. cool yeah. Because you fucking played it. Just, yeah, it's just like, like as normal as I think I am, it's not that normal, right? <laughs> right. But it might be one day if I have a string of a bunch of years where I'm on the radio a lot, all of a sudden that is normal. About, it's already happened in your it, career. Well, I mean, well, yeah, that's like, it's, it's already like I, I am already more normal than I was five years ago, but I'm not doing anything different. You're left field or all of a sudden left field is normal. Mm -hmm. And so you haven't changed, but the landscape is sort of right. evolved the, around you. The town, yeah, the town evolves. Your overnight success is 15 years in the making, just hanging out, right? But I think about, like, I think about Tom. He was not anything like what this town was about when he right. got here. You know, that's, that's a similar that story happens over and over again in, it in is different and it ways. Does. However, yeah. here's where I think it's different, and here's where uh -huh. I want to kind of dig into your situation yeah, a little yeah, yeah. bit, which is you are a logistician. You think about things very logically. That's fair, yeah. You've thought about it over the years. We've talked about it in terms of having a pedal board, not having a pedal board, <laughs> you know, like yeah, all totally. of that shit right, of, yeah. th that does very subtly mold that perception of who you are. Yeah. I think you've put a lot of thought into that. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, how has that evolved? Because you have done the thing where, you know, we've all experienced it. Like, for example, you experienced the same thing that I experienced of starting to get more calls for Ilya stuff, like where we're just going in and doing crank out the demo, make it sound like part of the problem, mm -hmm. replicate the whatever. Mm -hmm. You got thrust into that also at the same time where you're doing cooler stuff and being hired for more of the left. What was it like as far as doing that dance and where have you sort of landed in terms of being the guy that can serve all of the needs of everyone but having an identity? I feel like I identified in myself this tendency to almost lead with the the aesthetic of the whole thing, right? If I'm going to be different, my rig needs to look different and my instruments need to look different and people need to really see that they're getting something different, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not playing a pedal board and I've got, I've bought some projector amps from Austin and I, you know, like I'm going to be just 
lo-fi cool indie guy on this John Party record. When I opened myself up to the idea of liking what I like and not uh, writing something off because I didn't think it fit the perception of who I was, when I just went, maybe I should play a Mesa Boogie and see what it sounds like. Maybe I should not just write something off based on how, how I initially kind of react to it. Maybe I should really just sit with it. Maybe I should, maybe what I want for phase three of this, whatever this shit show is that's going on mm. is for me to be fairly Buddhist about it and just to not have a preconception. What I've kept safe all along is trying to be creative, being able to hear a good melody, being able to play in time, being able to play in the context of a band, being able to not make it about myself and like, all of those things I feel like have stayed protected and I was just, I feel like I was trying too hard in a couple of different ways to project an identity. And it's like, what if your identity is just that you're a motherfucker? What if that's all it has to be? And I look how I look and I don't wear shoes sometimes. And I, like I, I feel like I'm most myself currently. And that involves Marshalls and Mesa Boogies and Racks and Big Pet. Like it involves all the stuff that I initially was like, I'm going to differentiate myself. But you know what happens when you show up on a demo session and you don't have a pedal board? You are 15 minutes behind <laughs> for three hours. Yeah. You are scrambling, right? Because <laughs> you don't have the right sound and then you're running behind and you're making everybody else run behind. And so I started by by deconstructing the rig, the session rig entirely by going, I'm not going to do that. I ended up with it. Because I understood intimately what it meant to be without it. I understood why the heads go on a head switcher. And I understood why there are six overdrives plugged in. Because you don't have time. Everything that I say has a caveat, right? <laughs> but on average, what someone cares about in the session scene is, can you get the sound that I'm asking you for in the allotted time? And can you play me the part that I'm asking you for, or can you be creative or can you not? And can you just play the part, right? That that's the bulk of the job, right? Somebody might say, bro, what if you just plug straight into your basement? Awesome. You know, right. There are people who absolutely, who absolutely do care about the purest signal path between A and B. There are absolutely people who do care about none of that. But on average, I learned like, Oh, I'm, I'm placing a lot of importance on external things that don't have anything to do with making the music. And my, my musical life got better. My tone got better. My relationships with other musicians and producers, it all kind of got better when I just decided to just spend the next phase of my career dropping the preconceptions, quickly circling back to the John Party story because it's incredible. <laughs> do you want to tell her or do you want me to tell it? Oh, I want you to tell Okay, it. well, you also jump in if I've got some stuff wrong. Uh, the genesis of this story is a late night demo at the crack house right mm -hmm. way back in the day which was my old studio your old studio down those road very close to siam cafe which we're deeply fond of right yeah. it's like 10 30 at night this is heavy drinking chris days like we're all really hammered mm -hmm. john comes in with and we did this demo for this song and i feel like we played it once and it was just reckless it was incredible we crushed we absolutely it. crushed we it murdered that song and he goes this is the band i want to do my next record i remember showing up to ocean way you were there dave cohen was there i remember asking dave before we started i remember specifically going do you think he's gonna like us sober as much as he liked us when he was drunk. I think our experiment turned into him understanding, I thought I wanted to do something different, but I don't think I do. Yeah. Right? And I was the newest dude in the band, and I was trying to play as straight-laced as I could possibly play, but I just, I don't know that I would have done anything differently going no. back and doing it again, right? No, and, so, and, and here's the thing. Continuing on with this story, it should be said Nobody did anything wrong no. in any of this. No, like, right. I, I think I think the funniest part about that for me was that it went from I don't know, it's too distorted and there's too much reverb to I feel like he said something like I don't like the way he talked to me in front of my girlfriend. And I remember weeks after that, Rob calling me 
what, what are you doing? Man? What are you? He's like, I'm on the way to replace you. <laughs> I'm just like, like he would call me and tell me, and then he would call me afterwards. He'd be like, man, I don't know. They made me replace th- this solo on X or this rhythm part on X. And I don't know why, because it's great. And I think what ended up happening is that they did end up keeping a lot of that stuff from the tracking. It was a necessary experiment for him. It was a necessary learning curve for me. Right. And it's like, he goes, okay, I was doing this thing. I want to try something else wait, I actually don't want to go where I think we're headed. And then it was like, okay, Rob should be the guy that's on the next record because that's the thing that kind of ultimately rescued it for him. Um, I am on that record way more than I think. I think John didn't want me on it at all. That's what I heard. And, you know. And I am on it a lot more than I think, (laughs) than I think maybe he knows. There are so many situations where artists, producers, whatever, have a thing that works and then they want to try something else now that something else may not have worked which may have only been one thing or one player or one whatever but they'll go fuck it scrap everybody you know as a player in those moments you go was it me obviously there's an extreme here that needs Mm -hmm. to be avoided Mm -hmm. but i do think it's important to always in a situation like that go okay even if it wasn't my fault what could i have done better totally But the fault part of that and the extreme part of that is what we deal with, you know, where we go, okay, I got to change my gear. Right. Yeah. Like I got to, I got to rethink who I am. In those moments, it feels like, oh no, that was my shot and I blew it. Right. And it didn't turn out to have been that way. You know what I mean? Or we wouldn't be sitting here. Or we are, we wouldn't be sitting here. (laughs) And, and, and equally, I mean, I will say that like now I've been doing it long enough where like I have replaced my friends. I replaced Joe Walsh one time which is just bizarre to me. The vision changes, and especially if it's something like a, like a guitar part, right? If they change the drums, maybe everything on that tracking session doesn't live yeah. purely because the vision for one thing changed or purely because you, you've, there, there are a thousand reasons why something changes and it doesn't have anything to do with you're not good enough. At this point now, I realize that I didn't really have to do anything. Yeah. Everything that I did was reactive. I was firing off in directions. And yeah. while I've I've brought back little things from each of those places, mm-hmm. I've kind of arrived at the same spot that I started. Yeah. Yeah, like I almost feel like the, the most pertinent advice would be if a situation like that happens to you, don't change anything. So much of what we do is is reactive in a good way, right? You hear a song and you react to it or the drummer plays something and you react to it or you, you like it's reactive in that way. That kind of reactivity is necessary. And I think that's where the magic happens. But if you have a bad day and then you try to fix what might have fixed day one over here on day two, day two is its own day, right? This is its own situation. This is its own set of, circumstances and it's different song and it's a different room and the humidity is different and the engineer is different. Like everything is different. So you can't really apply the concrete specifics to a new situation. No. And you just have to come in and be, be receptive and reactive to the new situation. But at the same time, and what I think that they do too often is write those situations off entirely. Sure. Right. To say change nothing is not to say ignore it. It's not to say take nothing. It's not to say take nothing from it. Make it part of how you process the scene that you're in now, right? Would I process that same John Party record differently now? Yeah. Instead of writing off those situations where someone is obviously having a bad day or this is a weird experiment gone wrong or whatever, But somehow you feel like you've been told that what your instincts are or what your choices are are wrong. I was told one time, this is a a direct quote, hey, that part's not right. And I go, what can I do? I don't know. There's just something fundamentally wrong about the way you play the guitar. So I I have had that concrete experience of saying so you're wrong. That's the thing right? is you have to take those moments. Earlier in my career, I you know I would hear people say, "God, this fucking drummer is so loud," and I would go, "Fuck that guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about." Right. And then after a while, I realized, wait a minute, I'm hearing that 
from people that are angry, from people that are not angry. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing people in this studio, in that studio. You start to see the patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's when the change happens. Sure. Maybe that's a lesson to take. Like like for me, when I was like, I can't get a good power cord sound out of a combo amp. Maybe the reason that I'm seeing the specific gear that I'm seeing has a purpose and I should like try that out for a second, right? Or maybe when somebody says, I don't know, it's a little too weird or it's a little too mid range or it's a little too muffled. It's not a problem with my creativity. If I want to do this and I want to get better at it, why don't I try to take some of that to heart and and figure out how to get better at it? Sometimes people say things and you don't understand what it is. So you think that you have to scrap the whole thing. Yeah. When they're like, hey, I don't think this is the right tone. And so you're like, I got to change amps. I got to change guitars. I got to change, you know, whatever. Justin Kneebank, it could have been, he just needed a little more top end. He'll say small move. Yeah. When it's a small move. Right. And then you go, oh, okay, it's not, I'm not like worlds away. And that saves you from ever going down the rabbit hole of, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm so far off the mark that I have to change everything. <laughs> He'll say, it's hitting me as X, small move, right? And that like, so that it's, the communication is, the back and forth is important, right? How do you kind of like tell someone what you need, but put them at ease? I used to really take the like, you're doing it wrong thing a lot more seriously. And now finding myself in some of the rooms that I find myself in where my same old bullshit gets somebody standing up in the control room like this. And those, and it's, and it's people that I genuinely respect and admire and being the same person in a million different rooms and having one person say, there's something fundamentally wrong about the way that you play guitar and then having perhaps one of the world's greatest guitar players cheer you on for being yourself, it helps you start to unravel that and go, that's more about that person's musical concept or perception of what should be on the song. Like there are a million different reasons that it would be wrong. Right. And it's not that there's something coming out of you that's wrong like your ideas are just your ideas it's why steely dan would have 20 different guys play a solo because they're just looking for combinations and it's not personal we're all sensitive creatures everybody that we do this with right and we all really care a whole lot we wouldn't be here we wouldn't be doing what we do put on a hard face and give everybody in the world to fuck you if they don't like your art. Or you can figure out how to hear what somebody's saying and then kind of, kind of recast it in a way that's not personal, right? Because because we all hear with our own kind of filter, right? And I, I know what my default filter on the world is. And there are people who say shit that really kind of will hit it. it the deep seated fears that I already have about myself. Right. And you have to know that like when that happens, my perception of reality is deeply clouding what that person might be saying. It is so wildly important to the success of, of us as musicians in the service type industry to be able to truly discern what is our bullshit and what our job is. Yeah and figure out how to make that work. You know, there's a reason why we have an identity. It's not just because we can do everything. No, mm -hmm. because then you'd be good at everything. Right. Because we're really good at something and we kind of suck ass at other yeah. things. Instead of embracing my strengths, I embrace my weaknesses. I know where my blind spots are and I know how to avoid them. Like even if I get hired on something where I know I'm not the right guy, mm -hmm. do you feel like you've got a pretty good handle on what your weaknesses are and how to navigate around it? I am predisposed to think that it's all, like everything could be better all the time, right? Well, I think we yeah. all are, right? I would have a harder time openly appreciating my strengths than I would calling out what I perceive as weakness Dang, right? yes. for my, for myself, like, like certainly. And so, so even this part of that conversation, but I see that as a positive trait is why I'm, I'm asking right, yeah. about it. And so, so I, I tend to kind of underestimate and undervalue myself. I tend to really believe when someone kicks me in the ribs, when I'm already struggling a little bit, yeah. you know, I tend to have a harder time believing the celebratory, you know, positive feedback, whatever. And that's just, that's just my own 
my own disposition. We had a situation where we were on a session. I think we're both in the same boat. We know what we're capable of and what we're not capable of. We know what people, how people perceive us for the most part. And so when you get into a situation where they don't get it, whoever is asking the band for what they're asking for doesn't understand the band that they have. Yeah. Excuse me. Have you met me? (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, we had one of those days where we looked at each other and it's like, it's wrong band Wednesday. David Dorn saved us. Yeah. He always does. That thing where you perceive yourself to be not very good at it. And the thing that you're not very good at is what someone wants. Right. And I feel like a fairly broadly applicable guitar player. You can psych yourself out by approaching it like, boy, I really think, like, like think of the difference when you play something and the thought in your mind is, I think this should be somebody else. Or if you play it like, I'm confident that this part belongs here. Could be the same part. Right. Could be the same thing. I believe that it absolutely changes the way that it comes out of you. Well, and do you think that's positive or negative or both? Because there are times where I think, oh, my God, Nier should be playing this verse. Mm -hmm. And that's when I turn up my hands. Like I start doing more things on a hi-hat because I'm thinking, fuck, I'm the wrong guy for this. I should be trying to act more like doesn't mean I do a good job right? or it's anywhere close. But do you do you find yourself? I, I just I just think what I what I try to do when I get into that scene where I'm in a headspace where I'm a little. I'm a little too deep in my own. I try to just take a breath. And it's something that Brian Sutton said to me a long time ago. And I don't even think he was saying it to me to be like a life lesson, but he was just like, I'm going to just play this one more time like it belongs here. You know, like the intention, like it belongs here. And there's just something about that, that for me, even if you go, ah, I think Nier should be playing this. And so I'm going to do whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, like, like take inspiration from your peers or take inspiration from a thing that somebody else does. But the difference in whatever that part is playing it from a place of kind of like fear and maybe not sure if it's really going to translate, that makes it different. That makes it different than if you're playing it like you believe in it. There are those times too, where you play it out of fear and somebody goes, that's We like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it wasn't timid. It wasn't timid fear. It was like, fuck it. Right, yeah, you're just going, right? Or like, I always think about nervous vibrato on a slide, right? Every now and then, like somebody who doesn't really play slide and they don't know if they're going to hit the note and so they're just all over the place. And it's like that kind of thing, you know, in the right kind of sprinkled in the right situation is awesome. Unless it's a a nervous mandolin trill, we can avoid that. I'm hopefully retired from the mandolin game forever. Oh. Oh, yeah. So do you even bring one when you do acoustic? No, I I bring, Acoustic Chris brings a 12-string and a 6-string and a gut string. No bazooki, no banjo, no mando, no nothing. No, because you know what I, you know what, like, then this is another part of like, okay, while I was way too weird to be the, the electric guy or whatever, I could do a really good and still do a really good, like, dressed up songwriter acoustic. Like, yes. The, and, and you are well known for that. And, and that's, a, that's a thing that I do really well. And it's a thing that I appreciate doing. Uh, and I'll get hired for that purely because I don't play, like, I don't have the finesse or the hands of, like, somebody who's, in a, who's a specialist, like Todd or Ilya or Brian or any of those guys, right? Like, it just comes out of me a lot more dirty and rough around the edges. That's just how I play. When did you find, like, is it just because people, you finally started get hiring enough for people knew what you could do or what they wanted from you where they weren't asking, hey, can you throw down a banjo pass? Hey, can you put down a mando pass? I just stopped. Like, there's levels to it, right? When you start, you want to do any gig you can do and then you start to be a little more selective about what kind of road gigs and who you're going to go and if you're going to get, like, whatever. We all take everything we can take and then we get selective and then take everything we can take and we get selective and whatever. And, and for me, I just started to feel like I, like I'm a great electric guitar player. I'm a great acoustic guitar player. I'm a shit banjo player. I'm a shit mandolin player doing the utility side of that chair. Cause that, that comes, that's a common perception of like, if you're going to play acoustic, you're also going to play mandolin and you're going to play banjo and you're going to play maybe like 
fretted dough, bro. There's all kinds of things that you're going to bring to the table. I don't really play all those things, nor have I ever been. You know what ended it for me? A couple years ago, I was doing a record for Travis Howard. And he goes, man, just come and do all that cool, you know, like I'm bouncing back and forth. Just come and play acoustic, play, like just bring all your stuff and just be you. And we did a cover of Eastbound and Down. And he goes, can you throw the banjo on it? He goes, yeah, man, just do it. Just do your thing. But it's like, there's real five string banjo on that song. Oh yeah. And I just went, it's not me. Like that is not me. And I kind of got tired of bumping up against those things and feeling like it wasn't a good showing for me. Yeah. Feeling like this is not something I feel like I excel at. This is also not something that I feel like is a good representation of who I am musically. And I feel comfortable enough and confident enough in my work. And even, man, if you have to even sit down and go like, okay, what if I said no to the people that are asking me to do this? Go back and look at your books for last year. How much money was that? So you made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to accept less work in order to maintain how I want to be perceived. And just, and just a balance of like, how do I feel? It was wrong band Wednesday every time I took a utility guy call. Got it. In my mind. You know what I mean? And I was just yep. like, I just, I don't think, I, it's not the best perception of who I am. It's not what I really do. It's not what I really want to do. I should just, it's a, you can just not. I love that. Because you know? that's not, that's not what's preached here. No. And it, like, I do think no is a little more important than we talk about. Yeah. You know, like. No is good. Yeah. Because it's yes to something else justify it to yourself however you have to justify it. I mean, maybe there's not a way to justify it yet. Ten years ago, would I have said this? Probably not. I would have been taking every phone call yeah. that I would have taken, right? right. But, but I'm in a place now where it's like, man, I can... I love hearing that because, again, we do spend so much time talking about being versatile and being, yeah. being able to field anything that comes at you. Yeah. But there has to be a line there. And we talk a lot about your your identity, too. And so that's part of the identity is yeah. what you strip away from it. Yeah. It's a privileged position to have a couple no's to give. Right. Because sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you just have to say yes. And there are right. times. I mean, that's cyclical, too. Mm -hmm. I'm in a time period of my life where I, uh, you know, I'm not saying no right now. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that'll last for a week or a month or a year. Who knows? Right. And who knows? Yeah. And it and it just it just is. It's OK. Like, But they're both OK. Yeah. You know, well, I, I love your take on on applying that to individuality and, and your perception as a yeah. player, as an artist. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. This has been lovely. I have so much respect for you as being as taking a slightly different approach to this, mm. but in a way that is beautiful and makes sense. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of respect for your discernment in what you do and how you do it. So. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for having me.